uh, where members of the target group sometimes choose to react to that by appropriating the term and in some way reinterpreting it to defang it from some of its, its disparaging power. Um, and, and we have, uh, in the case itself and in society, uh, debates outside of the law about uh, about the effectiveness of the appropriation reaction um, and uh, the degree in which we can uh, regulate these forms of speech outside of the First Amendment. So here I'm thinking about uh, on campuses now. We have codes of conduct that regard certain uses of language like this to violate a code of conduct. We have critics in society calling that uh, an overstepping, a, a political correctness that's gone wild in some way saying that that, that regulation of language is inappropriate. Um, in the workplace, use of terms like this can give uh, uh, rise to hostile work em environment claims so that there are ways in which the law indirectly can regulate the use of speech like this even when it cannot directly regulate it. So, and, and of course in society, we have norms in, about expect, acceptable behavior, and, and one of the issues is to what extent are uses of phrases uh, like this acceptable or not, whether in jokes or otherwise. And, and so I want to start by welcoming Simon Tam. He's the uh, leader of the band The Slants, which is the petitioner in the case. Um, and uh, it is the choice of that name for the band that is the subject of, of the dispute uh, and the government's refusal to give it a trademark registration. Um, and I also want to uh, welcome our own Professor Phillips, um, who is directing our uh, intellectual property clinic and who has worked extensively on issues around the name of the Washington football team, uh, representing Native American challengers to the trademark registration in that case. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a word or two about Simon. So he's uh, the founder of the first and only all Asian American dance rock band. Um, and uh, he's a social activist dedicated to raising awareness of racial disparity, social justice, and issues that affect the Asian American community. Um, and uh, in, in addition to being known for, for this case, he's been known for his, his social justice work, uh, has given TEDx talks on systemic racism, uh, and has been on the TEDx stage 10 times as a speaker, performer, and MC. Uh, he's joined by some of the other members of his band. I, are the others coming or just, just the one? I think they're getting food. <laughs> uh, good for them. Uh, and, and Simon's been all over the media today. He talked to Nina Totenberg earlier today and was uh, talking to the local affiliate um, out in Portland, Oregon, uh, via the NPR station here. So, Simon, thanks for making time. And they have a gig tonight, so uh, <laughs> he's not done. Um, and Professor Phillips has, has worked, uh, in addition to directing the program, she's uh, our leader in, in, in the communications law area. She teaches the class, has deep relationships with the FCC, and has, has worked on Issues about the appropriate use of language, both in the in, in this context, but also in the media context, and has a, a sort of long history uh, of social justice work around uh, language and media. So I'm now done talking because it's time for you guys to talk. And uh, Simon, you've told the story about why you chose the the name of the band multiple times, but in this context, uh, let's let's advance the conversation a little bit. So there are members of the Asian American community who respect the work you're doing, who ag agree with your values, but feel like this method of appropriation ends up just reinforcing terminology like this rather than defanging it. What what's your response to folks in that debate, Ben? And how's uh, you know how have you come away from those kind of conversations? Um, sure. So to be clear, uh, we actually applied uh, for trademark registration twice. Um, and in our first application, we actually had a number of experts do quite a bit of work around that issue. Uh, in particular, we did a couple of independent national surveys, and they actually found that 92 to 98 percent of Asian Pacific Americans and Islanders support our use of the name. So um, that being said, that there's quite a number um, in our support, I never have claimed that... Um, all of them do. Our community is incredibly diverse. It is not a monolithic group. And, and we might react to words, imagery, and, and other things quite differently. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me. I, when I when I work in terms of uh, racial justice, I think about not only intention but impact as well, and and that's something that's incredibly important to me, and something that I spent many years considering before even advancing this particular case. When you look at how reappropriation works. Um, it's fascinating because it is an effective method of creating social change uh, that is indisputable. Every scientific study ever conducted on it shows that uh, reclaiming a language can destigmatize slurs and empower a, a group, especially when it's a self-referential use. Um, not everyone has to agree with that particular process, though. I believe that when you talk about working with marginalized communities and you talk about institutional and systemic issues, that mechanism is so complex that it often requires many different tools to dismantle it. Reappropriation is just one of them. So even for folks who disagree with me, um, we can both agree that it is still advancing justice. It's advancing that conversation forward uh, um, about how laws, how policies, and even how our culture can dispropor disproportionately impact uh, our communities. Great. Um, and let me just ask, I mean, the other, in the appropriation debates, the other point is sort of um, who gets to use the words and when, right? Um, and certainly around the N-word, there have been a lot of, where the, there have been appropriation by a variety of bands and other uh, folks, and, and sort of the in-group, out-group usage of these terms. Do you have any guidance for people who want to not be, who want to be, uh, correct without being sort of disparagingly politically <laughs> correct. What's your sort of guidelines for people in this new linguistic environment? You know, bottom line, ask. Yeah. Like, ask questions to those particular groups and the and the reference groups. Don't just make assumptions that something is or is not offensive to that particular group. I, I, I think with the uh, that's one of the fun things and one of the most powerful things about reappropriation is that it is confusing. It's deliberately confusing because when you can kind of make that um, the seat of power kind of questionable, it all of a sudden makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable. And for, for marginalized groups, that's an important concept because when you believe you've been living in a society that um, is you know, favors certain people based on their gender, their sexuality, their, their race, whatever it might be, when all of a sudden they're not sure how to handle the issue, that means our communities get to step forward and take charge and lead that conversation. Interesting. So, Vicki, let me, um, uh, we just heard Simon quoted an X percentage of the reference group are not uh, offended. And therefore, only in my case. In your case, there are only other in your case. So, so we are told uh, by the Washington football team that although they are not in, it is not a reappropriation usage, that, that only 10% of Native Americans find the name of the Washington football team offensive. It's got a long history, a long tradition. What's the problem? How do you respond? O outside of the law, we know how you've responded, and, and we'll hear from Jesse Witten on the panel who's representing them in the Black Horse case, but outside of the law, based on your sort of broader discussions with our Native American clients and communities, what can you report about that, those experiences? Yeah, well, that, that, that figure is, is out there. I don't know that, that I agree with that figure or um, accept the methodology of, of, of the survey that, that is older in 2004 and the survey that the uh, Washington Post undertook themselves, um, I think, just last spring. Um, you know, it's funny with it, just, just talking about the survey, if you sort of interrogate the people and the quotes that accompanied that survey, you see, you see the, the, the sort of ill effects of the use of that mark on, on the very language they use. Things like, at least people are paying attention to us. Um, things that just sort of strike me as not, statements that strike me as, as, as belying what, how they really feel in the, in the reported results. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't think of a more um, sympathetic, uh, sympathetic uh, person to, to challenge 2A than, than Simon, because I totally agree, agree with you. And I think, I think that um, 2A, though, should be, the government and the Patent and Trademark Office should be able to distinguish between 
um, sort of irony and 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 reappropriation um, and and taking a taking a term or a symbol even um, to to liberate oneself and to, to teach others and one that is clearly taken um, and for for not that purpose and offending and offending people um, so I support the and, and you'll hear more about the legal uh, the legal argument today. Um, but I think that two A should be more more robust to be able to. I just wanted to put it out there that that I that I agree, and that in your case as applied, um, that it, it was a bad decision in uh, by the office. Um, so I I did get the opportunity to work a little bit with with my great colleague Christine Farley and Rebecca Tushnet, who will be here later, and and Jesse Witten, who you'll hear from, who's worked for so many years on this case pro bono. Um, on the trademark issue, when Suzanne Harjo first challenged uh, um, the, the, the Washington football team's mark under, under 2A, I mean, it was an avenue used to stop something, to stop an injustice. You know, there are many potential avenues, but that was one avenue that, that, that she found was available to her. Um, and so after toiling in the, the sort of the trademark law, uh, First Amendment legal piece of it, I started to really think that I didn't really know about the harms. So, so like like Simon, in a way, I decided to go out and sort of um, talk to native native youth about the effect this effect on them because I had done a lot of work, as Michael mentioned, on um, media media children's television and, and hate speech in media and how it affects mostly our most fragile members or most fragile viewers and listeners. And the study that I did and the report I released with the Center for American Progress with a native staffer there, the stories of harm, the actual harm, it's about the farthest thing from what Simon is trying to do and, and his band is trying to do. Um, with his mark, the, the harm of the use of, of native imagery and slurs by non-natives is, is scientifically, and the social science proves that it's really harmful, especially to native youth. And the, the first-hand accounts we got were quite, were quite moving in that regard. And it's not just in Washington and the football team here. It, it's these mascots um, are throughout interscholastic sports. And thankfully, with, with in, the, in the civil rights era and with sort of burgeoning awareness on campus of, of the harms of this, many, many, many mascots were, were changed. Um, some, some that you probably are familiar with, Oklahoma, Syracuse, Dartmouth, Stanford. And in <coughs> those stories that I did with my students here at the law school, in the, in the white paper we wrote and the stories we wrote for a conference that Suzanne Harjo had at the Smithsonian, you saw sort of all the reasons for change. Dartmouth was founded with a real institutional mission of teaching Native Americans, um, and it just it just became in those in those voices of the students and the, the the natives who were to dress up and dance as as Little Red at the Oklahoma halftime show. Um, you still hear in this report we did in 2014. You still hear stories like that in interscholastic sports today. Not so much college because the, the NCAA stepped forward and said, we won't allow this. You won't do any post-tournament um, post NCAA sanctioned things if you have mascots like this. Um, and so the difference is so stark because the, 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 the non-legal research and the social science uh, interviewing I did really demonstrated to me that there's a, there's a, there's a true harm here. Um, and it's self-esteem, and it's not just to Native Americans and Native youth, it's to us. And one of my favorite quotes that I, that I came across was Kevin Gover's, the, Kevin Gover, who's the head of the National Museum of American Indian here, um, said, the, the Indian you most often see in Washington, D.C. is at a football game. At the expense of real Indians, real history, real culture, the petty stereotype has become expected. Because we don't know um, here in this city, we don't know many Native Americans, so that becomes reality to the football attendees. And it's not just the people who go to the football game, not just the 60,000 fans that cram FedEx Stadium. It's the 10 million households who watch football games every every weekend. It, it, thank you for that. And um, 
Simon, you commented in the Washingtonian piece about you know the ways in which you felt the Washington football team name. You you, you want to you know you're on the same side on the constitutional issue with respect to the trademark law, but not in terms of the appropriateness of of the use of this terminology in society more generally. And uh, talk a little bit more. Uh, other than the reappropriation strategy, you've also worked on self esteem within the Asian American community more generally, maybe. Uh, is there anything about what Vicky's saying is happening among Native Americans? What, what's your experience been in ter in more generally about the ways in which, uh, as you described, marginalized uh, communities are feeling that the names by which they are referred is contributing to that sense of marginalization over and above the economy and other things? Um, sure. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a common experience amongst many marginalized groups when you don't have control of your own identity when you're you're labeled in a way that uh, you disagree with you, you know we should allow our communities to have a right to define what's appropriate for ourselves and and in this particular instance with uh, you have a you know a racist football team using imagery using human beings as mascots uh, that i believe is ethically wrong um, and then who, who aren't able to control their identity. And then on the other side, you have uh, Asian Americans who had been using this term in a self-empowering way, uh, way for decades now, and the government says you can't do that either. And, and so it's been, um, it's a, you know, a very complex, very nuanced issue, but I, I think it's bottom line, it's about control and it's, it's about whether or not our communities have a right to define that that role, like of how we, what role we want to play, play in society, uh, you know that that right should be reserved for our own, um, you know, and you know, our own community is not excluded from this practice as well. There are there were actually numerous uh, sports teams called the, the Orientals, uh, and, and and as an Asian American, I would say that's one of the most uh, derogatory terms that one can use for for Asian Americans. Um, you know, those have kind of adjusted over time. Many of them became the Dragons or something like pseudo Asian. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, there is a, a profound effect when we when we allow uh, this to be kind of pervasive in our society. Of course, we have disagreements of where that change should take place, whether it be at a trademark office, whether it's in the marketplace or or at other places. But I think it is incontestable that there is a dramatic effect on people who already have kind of the feel like second class citizens when they don't have that that control. And I'm thinking about, maybe reflect for a few minutes, we don't have that much time, but uh, I mean, there have been a lot of changes, right? So I grew up in this city, um, and I knew and sang the Washington football's fight song because I was eight years old, and that's what you did when you were a football fan. And, and we're now in a moment where the members of the Washington Post editorial staff um, have chosen not to to name the team by its trademark, and and other members of the media have decided independently made a judgment that their use of the term, they don't want to be complicit in the harms that you just <laughs> described, and that's completely new. I mean, that was not even on the radar as as a possibility until relatively recently. And I'd give the folks involved in the lawsuit a lot of credit for helping to push that conversation forward, so that there's. Even if you don't win in the court, in the in the larger court of public opinion, I think there's been a noticeable shift in that particular issue. Um, but more generally, there's been a lot more sensitivity, at least, uh, on college campuses and in some parts of society around the use of terminology. And now we're hearing at the same time a kind of pushback against that, that, that we've gone too far, that... I mean, come on, we, you know, you grew up and you told jokes about another ethnic group. It was part of the, it was part of the American story. And when I was growing up, kids would tell jokes about people of Polish descent. And, and um, at, at some point, uh, sh I, I think that that point of view would say, we have to be allowed to talk about attributes that, that a, a particular, members of a particular group have in our humor, in our ways of interacting. Um, and now we feel like we've been straitjacketed by speech police who jump on us every time we make a little misstep. 
How would each of you respond to somebody who is feeling like at this moment in time, you know, they they can't speak their own mind because they'll be, you know, be told that they're being racist? Do you want to? Yeah, well, in the in the case of the Washington football team, it's it's not an attribute. It's a genocidal slur. It's not a name that's derived from the color of the skin, as most people think, as I thought until I got involved in this. It's a genocidal slur that meant the bounties, that meant the scalps for killing a native person. So that's a little different than a teasing about an attribute. That's a, that's a whole culture's history. Um, and, I, and, and, and what Simon said about mascotting, I mean, mascotting by its very definition, you know, but what Simon does is art and expressive. What the Washington football team does in my mind is commodification and commercialization um, of a cultural identity and a, and a genocidal slur. I mean, mascotting in and of itself means something little, diminishing. Um, Suzanne Harjo herself has recounted going to to a Washington football game and ask and being petted, people asking to touch her hair. It it's sort of it, it's from the from the turn of the the last century, um, and and centuries before when you conquer someone you take their uniform right. We we do it in sports when with we the rugby or crew we take the te- the other team's shirt right. We we wear the uniform of the conquered. Um, and that turn of century, that of the 20th century, that's what colleges and sports team did. They wanted, and a lot of Native historians have written about this. They wanted, they wanted to define American by associating with the savage other, but being different and being more civilized. And it's it's just puts Native people, in in the case of this team, um, in a in a sort of mummified. That's the way they are. They're savage. They're fierce. They look, you know, they're caricatured in their look. The, the, the mascotting of them diminishes them, and 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 that's why it's sort of a different thing than a than an expressive art, or a you know a a, a sideline a, a side joke among kids on a playground. This is a massively commodified image that puts native people down. And it doesn't, I just don't know that they would have the ability to reclaim that term given the years and years and sedimentary layers of, of being uh, put down by this term um, and with, with such a strong commercial stranglehold on it by this team. Yeah, you know, I, I think in regards to that kind of the uh, pushback that people say of uh, political cre- correctness being <laughs> kind of taking over, I would argue that those people are free to say whatever they want. You can use racial slurs if you want, but you have to pay the price. And if that price is losing social credibility of people calling you out on those things, um, that's fine. That's part of the price to be paid. And and so nobody is stopping those individuals from making those jokes that, that are maybe are crude or maybe that perpetuate racist stereotypes or that sort of thing. Um, we were actually just having this discussion as a band um, Yesterday, uh, someone was interviewing us and asking us like what we thought about Steve Harvey making a comment that uh, Asian American men were, were basically undateable, and a lot of us were like, "Well, first of all, that's just bad comedy." <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I was like, "Is he a comedian?" I didn't realize that, um, and we were kind of you know our first response as appreciators of of comedy and art was like, "If you're gonna come up with a joke, come at it." with good comedy you know it's got to be a sharply written joke and and then you know of course you could backpedal and say well that's not my intention and, and that sort of thing but again it's kind of like as i said earlier we have to kind of look at the difference between intention and impact if someone's intending to uh tell a joke we have to think about who is impacted by that who who's hurt and do we really want a society where we could say you know what let's just ridicule marginalized communities as much as we want to me, that's the ultimate form of privilege, that we should be able to say whatever we want, even at the expense of others. Um, so I don't know. There's a, a lot, of, lot of thoughts about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, I think at this point we probably need to, to wrap this up. And, and if folks have questions, maybe there will be a very short break. But we're going to start the legal panel at, at 4.15. 
Um, and um, I know you didn't say you wanted to do this for promotion, but tell us where your gig is tonight <laughs> in case people want to <laughs> um, remember the name of uh, it. That's the Electric Maid community space. I think it's in the Tacoma area of DC. Is that is that an area? It is. Okay. <laughs> the, the Tacoma area. Uh, we're going to we have what we call a conversation and concert where I actually tell uh, stories about what it's been like to uh, perform in this band. Um, a little bit of legal stuff for, for the law geeks out there of like what it's been like as an applicant to go through almost a decade <laughs> of, uh, of fighting the, the law. And, uh, and then we get to perform uh, because that's what we do. We're artists and we, we make music. And, and so we're really happy to share some, some of our songs with you. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out and, and chatting. And uh, we look forward uh, to the discussion in a few minutes. And could we please give these folks a... a <laughs> okay, we'll be back in, uh, in about 10 minutes. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's that? Now we get to hear the Oh, yeah. About all the fun stuff. Did you get a I'm going to load up the slides. I'm going to load up the slides. I'm going to load up the slides. I'm going to load up the Thank you so much for coming out. It was really great. Yeah. It was really fantastic to have you. We have an overabundance of lawyers. I was. I was. Fairness to me, I'm just wondering because, like Chris Pierre said, I grew up. Took the opportunity. I've been, you know, and now see you're here. Come to this. And oh, well, what did you do? I didn't. Kind of did you get more? Yeah, obviously, you know, it's not the end of that. I was. I had no idea that any of that. I know. That's because both of you are in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah, literally, just like singing the song, but you know, when they bring it to the forefront, they bring it to your conscience, you know, you want to stop. But I guess my question is, oh, sorry. You know, what question still runs? Do you want to come to the side? Oh, well, then you are. Oh my God. Uh, but I guess my question is, yeah, no, 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 I have to. Where, where are you? All that flying. Where are you? I was thinking that was the most sides. Right, right, right. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. That's I mean, that's for, right. that means it was a good spirited yeah. argument. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah. This is a pretty. <coughs> this is a pretty. This is a pretty Who else is? Right. Yeah. 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 Were they? I assume they were there this morning. That's what I was oh, yeah. 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 And then they were lunching in the room right next to us. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure Black Horse is there. Six. That's two. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Yeah. So this is six. I have this is six. I'm going to interview. Because they were you. Are. Yeah. I'm here. Well, if we get. Oh, really? Yeah, no, that's what I told you. I said. Oh, yeah. 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 Jesse is that guy there, so he's going to <laughs> Did you basically well, move down here for the last two weeks? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Months. <laughs> yeah, we've been down here for several months. Yeah. You were just going back and forth? Yeah. Yeah. No one. Oh, great. <laughs> I think right now we'll put you down. You'll be here. But I saw that he did he finally get a big round of financing. Thanks very much for coming out. Oddly enough, before, which doesn't include any litigation, the cost for a year. We we actually. Jamie, yeah. Are you on faculty here? Hey, right. good, good to see you. I actually get to America like at least once a year, sometimes twice. I was just here two months right. ago. I guess to some other case. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been a kid all the There's 10 years now. All right, we'll ask some tough questions. Don't worry. They're ready. Don't let my snoring bother you. I'm sure it's been a long week. <laughs> you teach international work? Cool. She's correct yeah. if you were 15 years later. Yeah, right. Hey, yeah, good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, sure. Let me give you my card. You know, well, I'm so, we're so good about teaching, put it, keeping their alumni network. Like, I go to their Christmas party, and they when they open up their new office last summer, or their, their renovated, you know, office, same place, but um, they had a big reception for alumni and stuff. And yeah, I, 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 I will open it. The only time I even coincidentally happened to be in New York during the reception, or during a time when they had a reception, like, oh, I'm not doing anything tonight. Just pop over for an hour. Okay. So, yeah. I think once or twice I filed an amicus brief supporting oh, their case. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. So it is, that is true. It's like you have, so it's a mandatory to, or process to go through, but it doesn't require it. Still, the case that the failure to register deprives you of the evidentiary benefits. Yeah. Uh, but you can still bring it. They didn't want to get the court, and they didn't want to get the copyright office. Oh. So, right. Um, Dr. Terry. What is she? saying is that I, I think you still have to apply. And the point is the court's not supposed to do a case. We're trying to distinguish. I understand. Well, I guess he flies home at yeah, I mean, the, the um, distinction is not as big as you were hoping. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, well, it's pretty sad. Out. Thank you for having us. I was just thinking to myself, what a distinguished panel this is. Hi, Jesse. Joel McCall. Hi, Joel. Hi, Joel. Mr. Tam. So, no, well, you have to order. I just called Terry to uh, contact the file. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to I actually had a great conversation with him in the summer. So we were on a panel together before the IPLA. And he was a real gentleman. I really, I like Steve a lot. Yeah. John, Mike, so. Hey, Mike, John Connell. Nice to meet you, too. Hi. 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 Yeah, it was a... Yeah, you know. They knew that the prior was, there was, there was You can move this thing a thousand times. You're never going to get exactly what it's going to be. It's all good. Equitable things. Again, at a minimum. Okay. Well, one, two... Three, four, five. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like they like. Yeah, some people think. 
filed it, then maybe suspended it's it, a good thing the settlement, it. and then it was unsuspended, and then there was like a, uh, I think maybe they it got to like that. testimony and nothing had happened, and the court issued an order to show cause, are like, you are you prosecuting the case? Okay, okay, and they didn't respond, um, it was default. No, I haven't. Yeah. The, uh, if, get if that is what happened, well, it's very good. Sometimes got beat up. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't. I would have wanted to, be, to have been either one of you this morning. One of one of the best uh, uh, posts I think was on Twitter by uh, Holmesley. Uh, he said uh, it, it, looked, it looked to me like the court wanted Lemley, to issue, Michael Lemley. Lemley, the court wanted to issue a unanimous opinion against both sides. <laughs> Were they streaming this? Sweet. They're streaming this, huh? Sweet. Between. <laughs> in front of a room full of two L's. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> the phone will be ringing off the <gasps> It's live. So, whatever you say on this microphone, everybody can you hear everything? They can hear you. <laughs> Just want to let you know. Just in case you don't want to say anything. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Just to let you know. <laughs> My son talked about a pizza yeah, today at school. Rebecca and I appeared opposite each other on the really? AR this morning, and we recorded a yeah. National Constitution <laughs> podcast earlier. Uh, it's not the original plan. Yeah. But, um, you know, the Supreme Court only schedules these, um, right. like, four to eight weeks out. So, you know, you find out it's going to be the grant cert, but they don't actually necessarily set the oral argument date. So, I think that... December, but Christine had already scheduled she's doing uh, education <coughs> and then after, you know, since we do them on the day of argument, we didn't have any flexibility in moving it, already said yes to you. So, I mean, she was the person who coordinated the law professor's amicus brief and is working with It increases every year. I think we're filing our limit. Last year we filed 65, uh, and it's about a third in-house, a third joining other groups, a third in uh, big law to get pro bono. At the beach. The breakdown last year was something like. Like 15 on the merits, 25 or 30 cert stage, mm -hmm. another 10 in the circuits, and like four or five state supremes. I think we should just. Stop. All right, I've called this person that I'm not sure if she's been in. Participate in many of our events, so this is a little unusual. But um, she might text me, so I'll keep my phone up. All right, we're going to get started. If people could take their seats, please. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, about the law, and I think what I'll do is. Uh, I prepared a very, very brief legal primer for some of the students in the audience who've not yet had uh, First Amendment law, and hopefully for students on the, the web uh, or other non-lawyers. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's an interesting facet of American constitutional law that the fundamental right to speak freely is so readily understood. But then when you go to the Supreme Court and ask, how does that translate into legal principles, it suddenly sounds like they're talking about the tax code. There's a lot of special terms of art that have been created. Uh, but the underlying principle is that the, you know, we live in a, a democracy where the elected representatives represent folks and, and can pass laws that represent the will of the political majority. One of the roles of the Supreme Court, however, is to protect the fundamental rights of the political minority against legislation that would overstep. And the First Amendment is, is where that uh, job of the court comes forward. Um, and and the court, as an unelected member of the uh, rep or a group of the government, is aware that um, their legitimacy uh, has to be sort of grounded in some principles uh, that justify the overriding of of the of political will of the majority. And so, what a lot of this terminology is about is the court articulating its principles for when it thinks. Uh, Congress or uh, has overstepped its bounds. Um, <clears throat> so if we, whoops, here we go. Uh, all right. Well, that's not here. Um, so there are a couple of questions. What the what the court is worried about is essentially the the political majority trying to suppress speech or viewpoints or perspectives. Uh, that it disfavors. The whole idea is that we should have an ability to exchange ideas, sometimes called the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and, and so uh, one of the roles of the court is to uh, in, ensure that ability to, to speak to one another. So the court first asked, is the law content-based? Meaning, do you determine how to apply the law based on the content of the speech? Uh, because the court's worried about picking and choosing uh, types of content that is favored or disfavored. That's, that raises the suspicion level of the court and therefore raises the burden on the government to justify its regulation. Um, even when the regulation is, can properly apply to specific types of content, uh, the court has introduced a second test, which is called viewpoint-based. So, for example, in a, in a case striking down a hate crimes legislation in Minnesota, uh, where uh, the defendant had been prosecuted for burning a cross on the lawn of, of a member of that community, um, the, the court agreed that you can punish expressive acts like burning something on someone else's property, um, However, um, if, if, if you pick and choose which kinds of uh, fighting words uh, based on the viewpoint, so the, the court said you're only targeting racist speech and gender-based speech, but not other forms of harmful uh, expression that, that is likely to incite anger. And therefore, it struck it down, saying that you've, you've picked and cho chosen which types of, uh, where the content is, these are fighting words, uh, but now you've picked and chosen among the fighting words as to which gets punished. So they struck that down. Um, so the general rule is if the, con if the rule suppresses or burdens speech based on its content, um, then it's subject to strict scrutiny. The government has a high, high justificatory burden. It has to show a compelling interest and show that the rule has been narrowly tailored and they've chosen the least speech restrictive uh, means of regulating the content uh, in order to achieve, uh, to protect that compelling interest. Um, and so you're gonna hear the terms content-based and viewpoint-based or uh, a, a bit in this discussion, and it's because there are consequences. If the law is content-based and it is suppressing or burdening speech, it has a very low likelihood of passing. Uh, it, even if it is properly based on content, if it is viewpoint-based, it has a very high uh, justifica justification that it has to meet. Um, now, there are other categories, other exceptions, where, certain, where the government has more latitude to target speech based on its content, and these are three that you'll hear about. If the government is acting as a speaker rather than a regulator, the government can make content-based descriptions about what it does and doesn't want to say. That's the easiest case. 
Uh, even when the government's not the speaker, but the government is subsidizing the speech, it is again not suppressing or burdening anyone's speech. It is simply choosing how to use public money in relation to other people's speech. And in general, the government has more latitude there. However, it cannot be viewpoint based in which in the way that it gives its subsidies and it cannot impose unconstitutional conditions on access to those subsidies such that it would indirectly be engaged in content suppression or, or burdening. Um, and lastly, I'm putting it on this slide, you might conceptually think of it differently. Even if the content is being suppressed or regulated, if it is commercial speech, the justification needs doesn't need to be as high. It needs to meet what's called intermediate scrutiny, meaning only that the government interest is important rather than compelling, and that the relationship between the regulation is substantial relation rather than the least restrictive. So that's other terms will come up, but I think you're going to hear government speech, government subsidies, commercial speech, content-based, viewpoint-based. Those are the terms of art. Uh, and the reason you're going to hear them is because the Supreme Court precedents are uh, basically point in different directions depending on which of those boxes apply. Um, so principles and precedents, we'll also hear about some of the cases where the courts applied these principles. And one of the interesting things for First Amendment geeks is that this case doesn't neatly fit into, into any in direct line of cases. And so there are at least four or five lines of cases that one might choose from uh, in deciding how to, uh, in, in when the court decides the outcome of this case. Um, all right, with that, uh, with that sort of uh, baseline set, I want to introduce our speakers and kick off this discussion. To my immediate left, uh, we have Jesse Witten. He defends healthcare providers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and other clients um, at uh, his law firm, Drinker Biddle, where he's a, a partner, and he's also been um, uh, the pro bono counsel for the Black Horse plaintiffs uh, that have challenged uh, successfully in the trademark office the registration, and in the district court, the, the registration of the Washington football team's uh, trademark. That decision has been appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, where it has currently been stayed uh, pending the outcome of this case. Uh, and Mr. Witten also submitted an amicus brief in this case as well. Uh, to his left is Ilya Shapiro, a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute and the editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Uh, before joining Cato, he was a special assistant advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues, and he practiced at the law firm of, of Patton Boggs and Cleary Gottlieb. To his left is Professor Rebecca Tushnet. She's taught at Georgetown University Law Center since uh, 2004, uh, was previously on the faculty at New York University School of Law, and will be joining the faculty at Harvard Law School uh, next year. Um, and uh, she clerked for Ch uh, Chief Judge Ed Edward, Edward Becker in the Third Circuit and uh, Associate <coughs> Justice David Souter on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, to his left, uh, or her left, I rather, is John Connell, who holds degrees from uh, Columbia University, New York University, and Rutgers. Uh, he was the law secretary to the Honorable Thomas uh, Shebel. Sheb did I pronounce that right? Shebel. Shebel, sorry. Um, uh, the Superior Court of New Jersey in the Appellate Division um, and has been admitted to practice in multiple different jurisdictions. Um, uh, he's got clients ranging from Fortune 100 companies to individuals in an array of commercial and employment, civil rights, and healthcare matters. Um, and John uh, had the privilege of uh, honoring, uh, arguing before the court this morning. Uh, so we'll be curious to hear what that was like. Um, and to his left uh, is, um, I'm sorry, uh, Joel McCall, uh, who practices his, uh, of the same law firm, uh, who practices on high stakes, complex commercial litigation and intellectual property disputes, including copyright and trademark infringement, uh, cyber squatting, rights of publicity, um, and he has uh, significant appellate experience as well, um, having been involved in the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit's uh, rehearing in this in this case uh, as well. All right. With that, um, I guess I want to uh, start with um, the Petitioner's Council um, and John. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, uh, get, based on all these different First Amendment boxes. Um, what is your position about? 
uh, Section 2A of the uh, Trademark Statute, ten, Section 1052A, which prohibits the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office from registering uh, uh, trademarks on a number of grounds. The one at stake in this is when the mark is disparaging. That's the magic word. So what when the court, when the government refuses to give you a trademark because the government takes the position that that trademark is disparaging, you argue it violates the First Amendment. Why? Uh, denial of registration under Section 2A um, is always because the government finds the mark to be disparaging, which means that it is um, offensive to a third party. It expresses a negative view that the government disfavors. Um, that is inherently viewpoint discri discrimination because at the same time, mark holders with positive or neutral views that the government favors are permitted to register and therefore derive the benefits of registration, which are the significant protections provided by the Lanham Act. Um, the Lanham Act itself is a widely available program to a broad range of mark holders uh, who seek the legal protections of registration. And by the government uh, selectively denying a mark holder because of the negative <coughs> views expressed by the mark, uh, that is viewpoint discrimination. That's just in the summary. All right. And Joel, did you want to add anything? to? No, I think from a constitutional perspective, John has answered the question, so so not really, no. Okay. Um, uh, we don't have the benefit of the government um, uh, joining us. They have a standing yeah. policy not to comment on pending cases, but I wonder if uh, either Rebecca or Jesse, since you, you wrote amicus briefs supporting the government position, whether you'd be willing to just... In, in the briefest of thumbnails, sketch the position they took, which is not necessarily the position either of you took in your in your brief, but just so we can have the party's positions that the court is going to focus on. What, what, how does the government characterize the refusal to register a, a trademark on disparagement grounds? Rebecca, you want to take that? Sure. Um, well, so actually I largely did agree with the government, uh, with the ex exception of a few details about government speech doctrine. But... Um, the government takes the position that this is a government program whose contours the government is uh, largely entitled to define, uh, that this is not viewpoint discrimination because it doesn't target a particular group for exclusion uh, or in or sole inclusion um, in the trademark system. It protects everybody across the board uh, and that the government's desire not to put even a minimal official imprimatur on disparaging terms is therefore enough of an interest uh, to sustain the regulation, given that no one is proposing to penalize the slants in the sense of sending them to jail or fining them, uh, or in any way stopping them from using the term. So, so maybe this is a simple case if it, if that's if that's it. Um, uh, I guess Ilya, uh, you you filed a, a brief uh, in uh, supporting the petitioner's position. Tell us if, what did you add? What what was the motivation for filing? And, and what uh, we did, added a big col full color beer label called Raging Bitch. Uh, that was a delicious Belgian style IPA. I recommend by my clients, uh, Flying Dog Brewery. Um, I have some copies of my brief here. Those of you who ask good questions, I might give you one. Um, uh, sure, sure. Uh, but the, the point that we wanted to make was beyond kind of the, the black letter law about viewpoint discrimination uh, or unconstitutional conditions, that's an important point that uh, it's, it's not that uh, Simon Tam is being thrown into jail for using these, these terms, uh, but that he's being denied a government benefit for exercising his First Amendment rights. Um, that is, uh, that uh, a trademark registration is an important uh, statutory right. Uh, it becomes a lot easier to defend uh, trademark infringements against your brand. Uh, if, uh, as he uh, uh, dis discusses in all the news stories uh, this week, uh, a record label is not going to sign a band if, they, if their trademark's not registered. Um, there are certain presumptions, legal presumptions, when you go to court to enforce your, your mark, that registration helps, etc., etc. And the government cannot, uh, under kind of axiomatic First Amendment theory, cannot uh, 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 decline to, uh, to give you this, this, this statutory right based on uh, your viewpoint. 
Uh, it can, in trademark law, say, you know, the, your, your mark has to be distinctive. It can't be purely generic, like you can have Apple computers, but not Apple Apple, perhaps. Um, it can't uh, be deceptive. In fact, the whole purpose of the trademark law, uh, the Lanham Act, uh, is to uh, prevent deception and fraud uh, uh, in, in, in commerce. Um, this this kind of disparagement clause, as long, uh, along with uh, kind of an immorality clause, they're, they're related, um, uh, is the, the lone kind of very subjective sort of uh, aspect uh, uh, to the whole trademark registration process. And we try to illustrate the absurdity of this uh, by talking, especially in the uh, musical space, about a lot of bands that historically have either tried to reappropriate uh, what was a slur, uh, like Pansy Division, for example, or Niggas with Attitude, or there's a whole uh, history uh, of that, uh, or simply to be expressive uh, or to be shocking. If you're a speed heavy metal band of some sort, uh, you might call yourself in a different way than if you're a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a string quartet. Uh, and that indicates something in the marketplace of ideas about your brand, which at the end of the day uh, is what trademarks are all about. And uh, you know, this is our third annual uh, funny brief, uh, as it were. Uh, just so have we're not going to file, you know, satirical briefs in like an environmental regulation case or something else like that. But with the First Amendment, when there are absurd government actions, whether it's policing truth uh, or truthiness in political discourse uh, or offensive speech, uh, it's a good opportunity to use uh, vivid examples. That as an amicus rather than as the party defending the, the client, that you have a lot more uh, leeway to do. Thanks. Um, so, Jesse, let me ask you, uh, although the, wish, the, the Washington football team wished in some ways that it, it, its case was before the court rather than this case. Um, uh, By the way, I always thought the, the, the solution, uh, non-legal solution for the whole Redskins controversy is not to keep the name, but to change the logo to a smiling redless potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll root for that. Um, but but uh, to what extent does the the presence of your your uh, case in the system do you think uh, uh, inf influence the way the court's looking at this dispute and tell us about what it was you were hoping to communicate directly to them in in your brief? <clears throat> well, there's no doubt that um, our case, and as Professor Carroll said, we represent Amanda Blackhorse, who's so far. Uh, successfully uh, been uh, petitioning to cancel the trademark registrations of the Washington football team. There's no case that no no question that our case is hanging over the uh, TAM case. It's especially locally. It's been in all over the press, of course, in Washington and nationally for a number of years. And overshadowing our case is the N word, and it, it has always been our s subtle and sometimes not subtle strategy to make what is obvious even more obvious, which is if you open the door to, uh, if you, you know, if you find this constitutional, the government is going to have to issue trademark registrations for everything. And maybe that's good policy, maybe that's not a good policy, but I think there are a lot of judges who will be uh, very leery about wanting to put on government, on the government official registry of registered trademarks, uh, some really sickening uh, racist marks. And in our brief, we, uh, had some pictures here of some marks that were uh, registered uh, that use the N-word that are really repulsive, and they were uh, registered before the statute was changed in the 1940s to its current um, form, where it says that marks that may disparage persons are not eligible for registration. So, you know, we, we, you know, we were not that subtle about it. Um, I can tell you that the government was... Uh, uh, felt like they couldn't be quite as brazen as we were, but we're really happy that we were brazen. And they cited to, you know, our, our instead of having to cite to this stuff themselves, they were able to cite to our amicus brief. Um, our amicus brief um, was intended to complement the government's brief, as an amicus brief ought to. And we emphasized uh, quite a bit uh, what I would, what I think is a simplistic or a simple argument, I should say. And the argument is that uh, Section 2A, which does not allow registration of marks that may disparage, doesn't burden the speaker. 
there's, you know, we don't get into the complicated stuff about viewpoint discrimination and and all the doctrines or which bucket <clears throat> that goes into. We we argue that you don't even get past the very first base, which is, is the speaker burdened here? And to, and to understand our argument, you need to understand a very important distinction, a distinction between a trademark and a trademark registration. What's a trademark? It's a word or a symbol or a combination that you use to distinguish your goods or services from somebody else's. What's a trademark registration? And how do you get a trademark? Does the government give you a trademark? No, you don't get a trademark from the government. You get the trademark just from using your words or symbols. Simon Tam has a service mark. It's a trademark for services. Simon Tam has a service mark. He has it because he started calling his band the slants and they had a certain symbol and word. There's nothing that this case will do to take away that service mark. What this case is about is whether that service mark can be entered into the government registry of marks. What's the value of being a registered mark as opposed to an unregistered mark, or in this case, in our view, an unregistrable mark? Well, as Ilya said, if you ever go to sue somebody for infringement, there are some evidentiary presumptions that uh, would be in your favor if you had to file that lawsuit and prove it. In other words, it would be easier to prove your case if it's <coughs> registered. There's some other um, benefits as well. So if you think about it, what is a trademark again? It's the trademark empowers you to silence somebody else. It's not the First Amendment. It's an exception to the First Amendment. If you have a trademark, that means you get to prevent somebody else from speaking the way that they want to speak. So the denial of a trademark registration, or in our case, the cancellation of a registration, might marginally reduce the trademark owner's ability to silence somebody else. But silencing somebody else is not a First Amendment right. You don't get the First Amendment right. Doesn't give you, First Amendment doesn't give you the right to prevent somebody else from speaking. So that was the um, approach that we took in our brief. I was um, pleased that... Uh, uh, this morning, Justice Sotomayor asked some questions that indicated that she may have read our brief. Because, <laughs> you know, there are 30 amicus briefs filed in this case. It's, it's hard to stand out. Um, and, you know, that's the, you know, we all put in a lot of work on our briefs, and the worst fear is that it'll never get read, or, you know, it'll get read like this. So that's how, that's how we complimented the government. The government made the point that um, uh, Simon can... Uh, uh, that, that, that nothing's preventing him from speaking. But we try to take it to another level, which is, moreover, what is this actually, what, how is he burdened? His only, the only burden on him is that he's somewhat restricted uh, by having an unregistered mark as opposed to registered mark in preventing others from speaking. Great. And, and let me ask, and I, I forgot to disclose in the introductions, I apologize, that I signed Professor Tushnet's brief, but I'm in my moderator role. I've walled off the amicus. <laughs> and, um, but, um, uh, but Rebecca, if you, tell us a little bit more about what you added. And on this point, you've dropped a footnote that somewhat uh, in a, takes a different position than the ABA a little bit on this question of what what is the burden of being denied a trademark registration? Um, the ABA's amicus brief uh, asserts that it is uh, uh, without question the unregistered trademark can still bring owner can still bring a, a claim under Section 43A of the Lanham Act, which is the part of the law that protects unregistered trademarks. Your footnote says the court doesn't need to get into that, and it's a little more complicated than that. So as you tell us about your overall position, if you, if you wouldn't mind for the trademark geeks in, a, in the room to talk about that little, uh, the availability of a 43A action for a, a trademark denied is uh, being disparaging. Right. So um, our brief took the position that the court should not use this case as a vehicle to decide a very uh, much larger and important question uh, about the extent to which uh, 43A is subject to the same limitations as 32 for uh, the infringement provision for registered marks. Um, this Im implicates a whole bunch of policy questions, territoriality, uh, you know, abandonment, um, uh, you know, deceptive marks, uh, you know, functionality, um, and this is a bad vehicle. Uh, there's another case coming up before the court, which I hope it'll grant cert on, uh, that actually 
puts this straight in front of the court, that um, most of the exclusions in, se in Section 2 are really good reasons to deny enforcement of a claim under uh, 43A as well. Um, the way I put it is, it's not wild-eyed lunacy to conclude that you know the remaining ones also express con congressional policies like against disparaging marks. Now, there are reasonable arguments to the contrary that you should still be able to bring a 43A claim, but that requires you to have a very detailed theory of what trademark is for. And you saw this even at the argument where people were saying, "Well, of course, you know, some of the exclusions in Section Two would also kick you out of 43A," um, and Let's not decide that. I frankly think either the, the burden uh, is enough to trigger invalidation or it's not. That is, I think that regardless, uh, that even if 43A doesn't provide a mechanism, um, the same rationale should control. So uh, that another reason the court shouldn't resolve it. Um, in terms of what we were trying to do, uh, you know, I was interested in putting in a, a structural trademark perspective, um, given that many of the arguments, like the 43A argument, had have implications beyond disparagement that I wanted to make sure the court was thinking about, regardless of the way it resolves them. So trademark, uh, as we've just heard, is a right to suppress speech, right? If Tam gets trademark protection for the expressive aspects of his mark, he's able to suppress other speakers, including a racist ban using the term to express its racism, using it ex as expressively as he's using it. Um, so this characteristic, both of trademark and of trademark registration, means that First Amendment analysis targeted at traditional punishments, so a bunch of the cited cases and modes of analysis, those are inappropriate. There's no neutral baseline here. Trademark registration is a government intervention into the speech each marketplace. And uh, that point also highlights that what the government is trying to do is regulate only the registration and commercial aspects of a transaction, not the expressive aspects of the mark. So this is how we get to the unconstitutional conditions argument, which is what I think is the best way to un analyze this question. Um, denying somebody registration does not deny them a government benefit outside the contours of the, pro the government program itself. So unconstitutional conditions is a doctrine that prevents the government from attempting to leverage its power to confer a benefit to change your constitutionally protected behavior outside the program. The government, we know, can decline to pay for abortions, but it can't, under this doctrine, decline to provide other health care to someone who exercised her constitutional right to abortion outside the government program. Likewise, Simon Tam can register trademarks in logos, names, any other features uh, that, you know, uh, that pass the registrability tests. Um, if he were instead denied <coughs> any trademark registration at all until he changed the name, then it would be an unconstitutional condition. But that's not what's going on. Um, we also wanted to make the point uh, that uh, this really isn't viewpoint discrimination. Um, and I think the reason is this. Why is viewpoint discrimination bad? Like, what makes it different and worse than content discrimination? The reason is it targets a particular group for suppression or a particular uh, people holding a specific set of beliefs for suppression. The disparagement bar just doesn't do that. Hating gays is a viewpoint. Hating is not. Um, and I think in trademark, you can see this actually by comparing it to the idea of materiality, making an effect on a consumer's decision. So in trademark, uh, you refuse to register a deceptive mark, but not a deceptively misdescriptive mark, as long as the deceptively misdescriptive mark has trademark meaning. Uh, if, so what does that mean in <laughs> plain English? <laughs> uh, right. uh, yeah, this is the fun part. Uh, the adjectives and the adverbs mean different things. So basically, um, if a name uh, fools you about a characteristic of the product that nobody would care about, um, so uh, if say a car, a car polish can, says it contains wax, um, but it doesn't technically contain wax, but it still polishes the car, uh, that is deceptively misdescriptive. Like it says wax, it doesn't have wax, but on the other hand, you don't care. On the other hand, 
uh, a deceptive mark like super silk for clothes not made out of silk um, is uh, discloses a feature of the product that people would care about. People care whether their clothes are made of silk or not. So uh, hot wax is registrable once it develops trademark meaning for the car polish. <laughs> super silk is never registrable. Uh, and so uh, and um, that too is actually about how the target group or how the target group of consumers perceives it. It seems to me that if a blanket ban on disparagement is viewpoint based, then a ban on material falsehoods and not on immaterial falsehoods uh, is also viewpoint based because it depends on whether consumers care about the feature you're discussing or not. Um, I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, uh, it is definitely content based, uh, as is the rest of the trademark uh, set of trademark bars, except for utilitarian functionality. But uh, I think that's okay, given that you know, in order for a trademark to function, we need to make these distinctions. So. Interesting. So as you can see, there's this <laughs> First Amendment expertise coming and this trademark expertise coming. Court's looking at it primarily as a First Amendment case. Um, but, and I think there's, uh, there's I, I do agree with Rebecca that this, this whole thing turns on unconstitutional conditions and understanding what, uh, you know, what's being uh, uh, given up and what rights are at issue. Um, I, so, some of this, uh, uh, <coughs> I think, discussion uh, is uh, kind of opens up the, this, this Pandora's box about the scope of intellectual property more broadly. I mean, that's a whole separate discussion, how, how strong... Uh, or the scope of trademark protection should be. I mean, my, my perspective is if you're going to have this system of registration, and it's not the government speaking, it's the government simply registering, administering a system that other people uh, create uh, to protect their own intellectual property, uh, then, uh, then it can't uh, discriminate in this way. Go ahead, Joel. There's a lot to unpack uh, in terms of what's been said, but one of the issues I do want to address is this notion that Simon Tam has not been burdened. Um, this has come up, and, and Rebecca has addressed it, certainly the government has addressed it. A couple of things that I think we need to keep in mind that are really very important, at least in the way that, that we have put forth um, a Simon's case. The first is, is that this is a facial challenge to a constitutional provision, and that's important because what we are saying is, is that in all instances, Section 2 way is discriminatory. You'll have to take my word for it for those that are not First Amendment scholars. I certainly am not one, but I've come to learn it, that when you have a facial challenge, you don't have to necessarily demonstrate the individual is being burdened. Be that as it may, Simon has been burdened. So what you'll hear everyone say is, but, but precluding him from gaining a, res a registration does not preclude him from using the mark. <coughs> and trademark attorneys, I see my friend Eric Pelton in the, in, in the audience will agree with me, the val that, that is a fallacy. And it's a fallacy because it presupposes that he can use the mark provided two things happen. Provided that he is not second in time, remember trademarks are property, first in time, first in right, is not second in time in a given territory. So when people say he's free to use the mark and he's based in Portland, Oregon, that presupposes that someone doesn't beat him in using the, 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 the term the slant in Chattanooga, in Milwaukee, or other places where he may not have the benefit of the registration. What, what benefit of the registration am I talking about? One of the seven or eight benefits, and there may be more, that one gets with a federal registration is nationwide priority. If, if Simon gets his registration, no one in all of the United States may use the slants in connection with music. And there's value there. So when people say he can use the mark, he can't. He can't. And so if the fallback is going to be, and, and now I'm segueing to, to a different argument, let's look at 43A, which allows that you don't have to have a registration to enforce your mark for the reasons I just provided. That's not going to get him there either. So I think when we say, or when the government says, or when someone says he hasn't been burdened, I think I think quite, that, that just isn't under, under trademark law. Uh, and, and even, you know, First Amendment constitutional law, for the reasons I mentioned, by virtue of being a facial challenge, I, ju I just don't think that's accurate. So the burden you're saying is that it's harder for him to silence people outside of Portland? <clears throat> I'm saying if you're going to contend at the end of the day that he's allowed to use the mark, mm -hmm. okay, which has been the government's position, 
It neglects the fact that he may not be first in all of these other territories. And by virtue of not getting his registration, he does not gain nationwide priority, which is what, you know, which is what every trademark owner, among many other things, values. No, you're certainly better off with the registration, for Sounds sure. Sounds like you have a First Amendment problem with trademark law altogether. Um, trademark law is, I mean, I'm not making this up. The Supreme Court has said that trademark law is a restriction on speech. It's an exception to the First Amendment. By the way, it's also said that about copyright. It's not uh, the, a restriction the Gay Olympics speech. case from the mid-1970s, where a group in California wanted to hold some athletic games that they would call the Gay Olympics, were uh, enjoined from calling their activities the Gay Olympics because of a uh, statutory trademark that the U.S. Olympic Committee had. In that case, the Supreme Court said that um, although um, this is an exception to the First Amendment, it passes muster under the as a as a legitimate um, regulation of commercial speech because it was a. If we'll move to the right slide. It was uh, it met the uh, the uh, intermediate test for commercial speech regulation that the court had. So in other words, it was okay. Uh, the the law that allowed the U.S. Olympic Committee to silence the people who wanted to use the words gay Olympics was okay because it advanced a sufficient uh, government interest. But yeah, I mean, there's no question, um, Ilya, that trademark is an exception to, to speech. It's an exception oh. that we allow because it has benefits. Okay, but that, none of that has anything to do with whether a particular mark is registered. <coughs> Um, none of that has anything to do with, the, with whether a particular mark is registered. Well, the, the statute says what's registrable. If you can't register, if a mark is not registered, right, right, right. But uh, to you know, uh, bracketing the idea that all intellectual property law or copyright and trademark is about silencing others or violating uh -huh. the First Amendment or what have you, bracketing that question. And believe me, within the libertarian community, we have these debates about intellectual property all the time. Uh, but we take the law as given, and the question here is: it's almost an equal protection one. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you, based on uh, the type of speech or your perspective that you're trying to assert with your mark, be denied because the government doesn't like it? And I'm saying, let the marketplace decide. The government shouldn't be deciding what's disparaging or what it doesn't like or what should put it. <laughs> right. I, 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 hold on for a second. I want Rebecca to, she had a quick response on the priority point, and then I want to move because as, as, as energetic as we are in persuading this bench, uh, the court has been submitted to another group, uh, and I do want to hear a little bit about what we can learn from the argument about what that group thought of these arguments. Uh, so Rebecca, make the priority point and then so, I want to... Um, well, it's actually a follow-up uh, to Jesse's who said, uh, 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 so the question is, why wouldn't these other slants have First Amendment rights in territories where the Portland slants were completely unknown? And uh, the point here is that the rationale cannot be about protecting consumers because by hypothesis, the you know Michigan slants are the ones who are known in Michigan. And in fact, it actually harms consumers to take them off the market. So nationwide priority is at a derogation from the common law. It's a creation of rights in places that never existed before. And in fact, it's actually about helping businesses manage their relations to one another. It's not directly about consumer protection. So it's important to recognize that uh, the Lanham Act serves multiple interests and one of them may well be uh, you know, the avoidance of discriminatory treatment in commercial uh, communications. Um, the other thing I, I would like to just say is I actually uh, hate the Gay Olympics case. I think it's distinguishable, and it's my, my reason is actually almost the reverse of Ilya's. So uh, he says, you know, bracketing suppression, um, we should ask whether you should be uh, denied uh, rights here. Uh, and I'm not sure you can bracket suppression since that's the entire right at issue. Uh, and I find it, uh, it it is very interesting that we are talking about denying registration based on the non-source indicating aspects of uh, trademark, the other communicative functions they have. Uh, the reason that I find that important is because all the other exclusions, with the exception of utilitarian functionality, work that way too. So that's why I think uh, I, I'm hopeful that the court, even if it upholds the federal circuit, will take that into account and explain very clearly what it thinks is going on here. All right. Um, so, John. It was an interesting morning. Um, uh, the, the, the case has now been submitted. Uh, it was what we call a hot bench. Uh, if you, I was unable to join you at the argument, but when you read the 
transcript. You had three justices all trying to ask a question at the same time. Uh, you know, First Amendment cases tend to draw that kind of energy, um, and intellectual property is an interest of the court, so that when you bring the two together, it's not surprising. But what what, what was it like, and, and what's your view about the kind of reception that your arguments got before the court today? Well, again, just because the case is pending, I don't want to do, comment too broadly about that. But I will say, I said to Ilya before we began here today that um, probably one of the most accurate postings I saw on the Internet today was a tweet that said that um, it seemed as if the court wanted to rule unanimously against both sides. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, the Federal Circuit has not had the best track record at the Supreme Court, so that's, that may be part of what's going on there, too. Um, but why don't we stay with the petitioner's case? Ilya, what, what was your view about sort of the reception of the petitioner's argument and your supporting argument? Uh, yeah, it, it seemed like the court was struggling with how exactly to write this opinion. Uh, generally, you don't win or lose a case at argument. Um, but I think they, the justices overall weren't satisfied with either the government uh, or the petitioners in terms of how to set a bright line for what they're going to do, uh, what they're going to do here. Just in terms of uh, you know counting votes, and uh, luckily I'm not paid uh, for my predictive abilities. I don't think that's possible with the Supreme Court. But I think there there are five votes for the petitioners. Those being Roberts, Kennedy, Alito, Kagan, and probably Ginsburg. Breyer, I think, is on the fence. Sotomayor, I think, is going, uh, leaning towards the government. Thomas was silent, um, uh, as is his wont. Oh, but of course, Thomas was the deciding vote on the Confederate flag battle, uh, Confederate flag license plate case uh, last year, or two years ago, uh, joining the liberals without uh, a separate concurring opinion. Um, so uh, that case, I think, is, is, is distinguishable, the license plate case, because it's not actually, you know, a trademark registration. It's not the government. Cannot no, nobody thinks that every trademark is endorsed by the government. You know, it's not like the government is endorsing such venerable brands as uh, "Take Your Panties Off" and uh, <laughs> uh, "Capitalism Sucks Donkey Balls," and that's just the tamest ones of the tens of thousands that are in the 18-page appendix of the uh, Pro Football Inc. That's the Redskins' uh, uh, brief. Uh, that was uh, uh, kind of funny, but it, it kind of shows all of these trademarks, and in no reasonable world would you uh, understand the government to be speaking. Anyway, th that's how I, how I would def uh, distinguish the Confederate uh, uh, flag case, and maybe Thomas would as well. I don't know, but anyway, I, I think that there are five votes uh, uh, for the petitioners, and five is, is all you need. But uh, again, you're, you, that, that prediction is worth what you're paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Jesse, what was your takeaway? Uh, I have to agree with John. I felt like the court wanted to rule unanimously against both sides. This is, um, and I have to agree with you, Professor, this is a case that does not fit, obviously, into any established First Amendment uh, doctrinal bucket. They're going to have to really figure out where to put this. Maybe they've decided. I, I, I've actually felt like a surprisingly large number of them seem to have an open mind from, from my sense of, of what they were, or, or let's say undecided still. But um, I, I, I really have no instinct about how this is going to go. And, and there, are good, there are good arguments, and there are a lot of weaknesses on both sides. Interesting. And, and Rebecca, if, when you give us yours, uh, in particular, uh, Justice Kagan strikes me as, as one of the minds in the court who draws some of the sharpest distinctions. And uh, she appeared to be quite hung up on this content-based versus viewpoint-based sort of uh, characterization of the denial or of the disparagement uh, standard. Um, and when it was presented to her that, well, we, we, your argument is that it's only content-based because it prohibits any disparagement of anyone. So a lot of the ways that viewpoint discrimination was being treated is it permits you to say nice things about particular people, but you can't say disparaging things, and therefore you're picking one viewpoint over the other. But in your brief, the argument was, uh, no, you're, you're being uniformly equal that you can't be disparaging, and that's what we do in libel law. Justice Kagan was presented with that and almost batted away. She just said, well, that's historical. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that quick. What, yeah. what should we read into that? So um, a, a couple of things. I mean, I will give no prediction whatsoever because uh, I also think you can't tell. Um, 
Uh, so uh, I thought that was a little facile because uh, there's still a question of, you know, how do we understand that? Uh, is it an example of viewpoint discrimination? Is defamation law viewpoint discrimination? Um, that seems weird to say. It seems like defamation is a category of things that is different than non-defamation, uh, not a specific set of viewpoints. Um, and uh, I... I take the point that they're historically unprotected, but we still might want to take lessons from, you know, what is historically unprotected and why. And I go back to what I think the the, the Solicitor General uh, um, came back to is, you know, why do we have viewpoint discrimination as a doctrine, right? Uh, we're, wor we're particularly worried about certain kinds of government interventions into the market, and uh, the, they're ones that put the thumb on the scale of some group or against some group. Uh, and I don't see that this does. Uh, so there's this moment in RAV versus City of St. Paul where the uh, Justice Scalia says, you, look, you can't force one side to fight by Marquis of Queensbury rules uh, while the other side is allowed to fight freestyle. And that is not this situation. If that's what viewpoint discrimination is, then you know nobody gets to fight freestyle, uh, which seems different. Um, but that being said, is if you called this viewpoint discrimination, would you create huge problems with doctrine? Like it's not traditional viewpoint discrimination, but this is unusual enough that it's, I can't say it'd be hugely disruptive to call this viewpoint discrimination too, because there are no obvious analogs. I think it creates some conceptual problems, but you know, uh, the court has, has papered over far worse ones in the past. <laughs> Um, so defamation is kind of beside the point as well because you can't have group defamation whether you're talking about blasphemy in the religious context or other kinds of groups um, uh, and you can't use a person's name as a mark without his or her consent regardless uh, so this actually came up just Justice Sotomayor asked let's say I don't know why she picked Donald Trump and maybe she was trying to have her cake and eat it too but she said before Donald Trump was a public figure was the began the hypothetical? Mm -hmm. Could you trademark Donald Trump as a thief? And the answer is no, not because it's defamation. That's a kind of separate analysis, but because it involves the name of a particular person, which you generally can't trademark again unless without their consent in certain other circumstances. So the parallel in this context wouldn't be the slants versus you know Asian Americans are great. It would be if uh, Simon Tan had a big musical rival named I don't know Johnny Chang, uh, and he wanted to trademark Johnny Chang is slanty eyed. You know, that would be the parallel, and that may or may not be defamatory, but it also is not registrable uh, because it involves the name Johnny Chang without his permission. Well, so actually, uh, and this is where it would be so nice to have some, you know, IP expertise actually uh, in, the, in the people who are arguing it. Um, the legislative history of the Lanham Act <laughs> contains... Uh, about one line about why they added in disparagement. And it is precisely to avoid false associations. Um, interestingly enough, because uh, the provision Ilya is talking about covers only uh, living people, not dead people, and the reference in the legislative history is to Abraham Lincoln Whiskey, which this person did not want registered, uh, the, the, the congressperson talking about this. Um, so one of the ways to see the disparagement bar actually is as a, uh, as a counterpart to uh, the, you know, no personal name, no false connection. Uh, the sort of equal, like you can't disparage, and also you can't praise to the extent that, uh, uh, that you don't have permission to do so. And I have to, I can't help myself as a, as a music guy to drop in that the, the name of the band Better Than Ezra was uh, created at a battle of the bands when the group hadn't figured out what their name was, but the local <laughs> popular band was Ezra. And so they decided to call themselves Better Than Ezra. But anyway. And um, let me just add to that very point, though, about uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Jin. Uh, that goes back to the original legislative history. And that was absolutely cited in our briefs that were submitted to the court, but not in the context of defamation, but in terms of the then emerging tort of, of privacy, that being the right of publicity. Um, so, uh, it, 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 and that has not developed, you know, contiguously with, with the, the, the IP jurisprudence over time. So, um, that it's a different animal entirely.
All right. Well, we, we have uh, not that much time left, but uh, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. If, if anyone's uh, got any, we've got about 10 minutes. Because this is really an easy case. It does lend itself to, you know, one side being right and one side being wrong. <laughs> Sir. Given the difficulty the court seemed to have with the bigger issues, I was a little surprised, John, that you spent no time at argument uh, on your alternate ground for affirmance that the mark isn't disparaging. I, I, the, the maybe you don't want argument? to talk about... No, he's, ta he's talking about the, you're talking about the constitutional avoidance argument. Yeah, right. I mean, well, there's two parts to it. One is, is that, yeah, so the first part of it, that, that slants here is not, it's context versus intent. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, again, those, those were arguments that were not um, identified in the question presented, and it was just a decision that was made that um, since the court was teeing up the First Amendment question, that was what we needed to address. If they wanted to explore those other issues, we would take their lead. And, and Paul, in fairness, I just, you know, he wasn't asked a question on that score. So obviously, he's yeah, but it obviously, it was a tactical decision not to mention that at oral argument. I just, right. I don't know if you want to, I guess you've answered that. I don't think he had a choice. They were yeah. they were pounding him with right. one First Amendment question after another. That's well, what actually, they he sat down with some, time remaining. Uh, okay. What's that? He sat down with time. It sounded, I was in council room. I. I didn't get into the main left. courtroom. Yeah. It seemed like you had time left. <laughs> I, I was surprised the court wasn't more interested in the vagueness issues because that, yeah. that was, there was a lot of joining of that issue in the briefs. Um, that the idea that uh, there's no real direction to the trademark examiner about what's acceptable and what's not. The uh, San Francisco Dykes on Bikes brief, I think, uh, illustrated this very well. With their own battle, that is, finally they got their name trademarked, but their logo was rejected because they had their name in it, which was kind of bizarre. Uh, also, um, uh, what was it? Oh, right. Uh, so... Uh, the PTO denied trademark registration for Have You Heard Satan is a Republican, but granted it for The Devil is a Democrat. I don't know if that was political bias based on who was in charge of the PTO at the time. Or look at this. Uh, this is from the Redskins brief again. Registered marks include Yard Apes Landscaping Service, Afro-Saxons and Dago Swag Clothing, Baked by a Negro Baked Goods, Crippled Old Biker Bastards Clothing, Yid Dish Online Dating Newsletter, Cracka as Skateboards, Retardopedia Entertainment Services, Boobs as Beer Holders, the JJ Hat Party Hats, and Match a Snatch Playing Cards. Now, those seem pretty disparaging, much more than the slants for that matter. Uh, and yet. JJ seems disparaging to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know what playground you grew up in, but we had Asian kids, and I've never heard the. the, the I mean, intellectually, I know of the slur slants, but I, you know. Uh, anyway. Yes, but I've never heard what JJ used as a slur. Although, can I just ask? Um, well, so he's he's I, bridging it now to scandalous and yeah, The. the um, the, so the <laughs> Solicitor General uh, uh, had a, had a tough time, um, and um, but on this point, if we put vagueness aside, uh, so the vagueness argument is simply that there's not enough guidance for this disparagement standard to get applied in any principled way. Um, but the Solicitor General said, you may be able to come up with a number of examples of registrations that were permitted, but nobody's come up with uh, sort of uh, disparaging marks that were uh, uh, it, 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 that were rejected. How about this? Were, the PTO or non-disparaging marks that were rejected on disparagement. The, the office has registered fag dog three times and has refused it twice. So, but but That's can you find can you find a non-disparaging mark that was refused registration on the grounds that it was disparaging? That, that was what well, it is. depends on how you define disparaging and who... Yeah, but the problem with that yeah. analysis is it's the government's burden. It's the government's burden to show that. And so that, that, that formulation presupposes that it's now the applicant's burden? You know, uh, it, uh, the vagueness is a whole other panel. We, can we do it tomorrow? <laughs> and uh, one of the open questions on vagueness is... Um, can you can you do a facial challenge to a statute on vagueness grounds? And the Supreme Court has said yes, and the Supreme Court has said no. And um, so the Supreme Court's being vague on that issue. <laughs> they're, being, yeah, they're being inconsistent. So, um, you know, point we made in our brief, and the government did as well, is that um, you know th there may be some uh, cases that are really hard, but there are some cases like the N word, which are not really hard, and the statute should not be struck down. In its entirety, facially, uh, if there, you know, it has to be case by case. 
And uh, but we cited cases that say it has to be case by case. The some of the amicus briefs and the and the football team on the other side cited cases that, and, and as well as as well as you guys at the at the end of the table cited cases that you can do a facial uh, challenge to vagueness. So this case has so much in it; it's unbelievable. I mean, I I, I had no idea what I, was, what I was getting myself into. I <laughs> signed on to you know do this pro bono six years ago, but it's it's <laughs> even a, even a simple question of can you know how do you bring a vagueness challenge to a statute turns out to be incredibly um, unclear. Uh, but here's the, here's a point we made, which I thought was important. The district court agreed with us in, in our case. Um, when the Supreme Court issued its decision in Marsh v. Chambers, which is a decision that explains when a state or other legislature can begin a session with a prayer, uh, they created a, which is a, a, a um, an establishment clause issue. The Supreme Court articulated the test of what the prayer has to contain or not contain. And it says it's prayer's fine so long as the prayer does not proselytize in favor of a religion or disparage another religion. So, you know, if that's how the if that's the word that the Supreme Court employed to tell us how to interpret the establishment clause, uh, I, I think it'll be a little embarrassing for, for them or hard for them, let's say, to find that the expression may disparage in this statute is vague. I mean, you can do it, right? You can find a way to distinguish anything, but it does seem uh, like an anomaly that we that we pointed out and that the district judge in our case seized upon. Yeah, I don't know what to read into it, but Justice Kennedy posed a couple of questions uh, talking about the statute, or a properly drawn statute, suggesting that there might be some uh, the vagueness concerns might get uh, sort of uh, dealt with in in a sort of mandatory. So, so Roberts will rewrite the statute to make it into a tax and therefore make it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the, uh, so, there is an irony with vagueness that I just want to touch on. I, I was actually principally involved in writing the initial brief before the three member federal circuit panel. And I threw in this constitutional stuff at the time because I thought if we ever got here thinking, you know, this is the issue, the original issue with Simon's application was an evidentiary one. The board had made certain findings that were just simply not supported by the record. The oddity was, though, that the vagueness argument I long thought was the stronger of the arguments, but of course, as a technical matter, was never the one that this court, or for that matter, even the federal circuit when it sat on banc, put before the parties. Ju Judge O'Malley below and um, was joined by somebody. Judge O'Malley wrote the wrote the, the separate opinion on that. But I, but I have just in, in the five years that I've been involved with this case, I've long thought that the vagueness argument was the stronger of the of the arguments with respect to viewpoint. You know, I guess vis-a-vis -vis viewpoint discrimination. Interesting. So Meredith, I'm going to give you the last question, and then. Um, so I guess my question goes to in the panel before this, we had a discussion um, about with. Simon and with Professor Phillips about the difference between reappropriation and reclaiming of terms that could be disparaging versus their use in commercial speech by outsiders. And on one hand, I think for a lot of people that lines up with their sort of moral or emotional evaluation of this issue, of sort of what's right and wrong. And then I think we've talked about in the First Amendment context that that actually, that sort of reaching into what people are intending and what their sort of viewpoint is and that context makes it almost worse from a First Amendment analysis of the government's actions. And so I guess the question is, is there a way for the court to try to thread the needle on that and make a distinguishing uh, test about it, sort of disparagement that brings into the, that sort of outside moral sentiment about reappropriation versus outsider use? I sure you know not. the the the, re, the re, as a as a sort of a, a fundamentally a trademark lawyer the reappropriation argument I have to tell you is is one that has hair on it because it invariably necessarily looks to the applicant's intent and I think Rebecca will agree with me I'm sure she'll she'll let me know if she disagrees <laughs> that uh, you know the, the the trademark office can never care about the applicant's intent when they apply for a mark for a couple of reasons not the least of which is that intent can change. That is, Simon can register his mark today for purposes of having a political and social message that advocates Asian pride. He can very easily tomorrow decide that he wants to become a raging racist. And, and so you can, if you're going to look at intent, you know, 
it can certainly be a proxy for something far more nefarious if that ultimately decides to be a goal. The other issue is, and I think the one that's probably more common in this case, is that trademarks are freely assignable. So you can't marry an applicant's <coughs> intent. And, and again, by, when I say intent, I'm using that really as a as a as a um, a synonym for your notion of reclamation, uh, because it doesn't. I mean, Simon may have that goal, but if if he decides to assign the mark to me, I don't. I don't have that same reclamation objective that he might. So, again, from a trademark perspective, I think I think reclamation, and of course, Dykes on Bikes has gone to town on this. I th I think it's a problem. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> so from, a, from a First Amendment perspective, it, it would also look odd to protect. Uh, speech based on the nature of the speaker rather than for the speech itself. That's just generally not done in other contexts. Um, but look, um, kind of tying together to something you said, you could imagine the most vilest, racist mark you register it, that doesn't mean it's a guarantor of commercial or other success in the marketplace. I mean, I suppose the vile racists could try to suppress each other with their competing marks or something, but otherwise, I mean, in the previous panel, they talked about college football teams. Dartmouth and Stanford and all the rest, they changed their names not because they were deregistered their previous trademarks, but because they found it untenable uh, or because they were part of an association in the NCAA. But anyway, it wasn't the government telling them uh, uh, to do this one thing or another. So these sorts of uh, uh, private solutions and, and ultimately if people are so offended by the slant's name that it hurts their ticket sales or album sales, or you know, uh, then that, that, that'll take care of that issue. I think the statute just doesn't let you look at intent. Yeah. Just the words of it. And it is one of the interesting things about this is that First Amendment law is not intentionally <laughs> not responsive to those some of the distinctions that we make in, in society like that because of the difficulty and for all these different reasons. Um, we have more uh, opportunity to, to have Q&A out at the reception. Um, and thanks to the folks on the internet who were able to join us. Uh, could the people in the room please thank our panelists? And like I said, I have extra ones, uh, extra hard copies of the, of the Cato and the Deplorable People and Organizations Brief, if anyone uh, wants them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. We will. Yeah, we have that data. Um, I can ask Mike. Mike. Yeah. Mike can tell us like who's on it now. Can I ask you what you mean? I suspect we have a question. How are you? I know. I mean, and and uh, and I'm the first. So I I can't. I don't know exactly. I don't think you're Don't talk about the possibility I have to see what you're doing. To satirize the law, to show the absurdity of the law. Hey, no, yes. right. We're done. I don't know. Yeah. We conduct war in a case called Susan B. Anthony List versus Ohio Election Commission, okay. and then the Confederate License Plate case, uh, 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 Walker versus Sullivan. Uh, 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 that's like they'd be very well, I think so. And it's it's hard to do. Please. It's hard to do. Uh, because you have to hit the right tone and it's not just like like using offensive words to be offensive, which would just be shock value, you know, that that's not the, the point of it. But um, yeah, I think I could see you know, I don't bear fairly well. I could see his kind of sense of humor working in, in that context. If you can apply that sure to what would otherwise seem to be dry, you know, telecommunications act stuff. You know, uh, I did. I always really just uh, really remember him saying you know, if we can write something funny in the brief, yeah. that's not ridiculous, but so what very what do you that? I'm a constitutional generalist, so over the years, uh, everything from the Commerce Clause and Federalism to the Second Amendment and the First Amendment and criminal procedure, I mean, it's kind of like uh, I have a small uh, a boutique, uh, as it were, that uh, uh, whatever the big issues of the day are, whether at the Supreme Court or things that come up in national political debate, like is Ted Cruz eligible to be president, or one of these micro issues, the volume response, you know, 
Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rapid. If you want to bring over to the mics, I didn't know. Like, if you care, I'm not. I, I like publicity. This is it's kind of melds my inclination to self promotion with uh, you know Cato's desire to get our ideas out. So I'm happy to have you. Okay, I I guess thank you guys for being here. Absolutely, because I'm trying to grapple with how do you and maybe you just simply can't. How do you put these two aspects of law together? The trademark aspect of it, and the constitutional aspect of it, or do you just simply have to separate? Not every. I think that most IP cases don't involve constitutional issues, and most constitutional issues don't involve IP. So we held the line. Thank you. That's really all. You guys have a nice day. Unpredictable outcomes. Thank you, sir. Good thing. There was a section. I don't know if you read Greg Dolan's brief. There's a section on that model. Well, I clerked with Greg Dolan. Okay. Right. So. I mean, he's the one that's called, would be better positioned to, uh, you know, argue with uh, Rebecca because I, I never claimed to, you know, some of the stuff that she was saying. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a fascinating case to me, and the bigger point for me is the last thing you talked about. What's the scope of IP in general? That's the more important issue for me as a patent person. But uh, yeah, good argument. So thanks for coming. Sure. Yeah. Matthew? I just had a, a question. I, I uh, went to George Mason uh -huh. Economics, so pretty much libertarian. But um, my, what I've always wondered is, and I worked at a tiny law firm. So my question is, has there ever been a study where you looked at the value of trademarks? All right. No, that was good. Where they arose to supremacy without a registration. The justice case court said, "I have no idea." I was just talking to you. I can't talk to your IP professors about it. You're in for a diamond for a dollar. I don't know. What do you say? No. Or Greg Dolan might know something. He's the one of the. The lead uh, uh, professor okay, on nice the oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. and he, he has that long uh, on perspective. So uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. So they just want to monetize the value of registration. Oh, that's a very good point. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the yeah. 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 support. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what happens. But I don't know. Yeah. 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 Court really uh, thinks every time maybe that's a good place to start. Um, 20 hours. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, when you see her, tell her we're right. She's wrong. Yes. Long day. Well, mine continues. I have a uh, reception to go to and then a dinner. Yeah. 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 And I well, be well and thanks again for your support. My pleasure. What Rebecca Tushnet, and we didn't get the, into this today, has written it's either a paper or it's in her briefing that she says, if you apply our rationale, the rest of the trademark criteria crumbles functionality, descriptiveness, genericness, and it doesn't because they are content based. What, what Josh Skiing was saying this morning, I was there. Like, <laughs> you. Excuse me, thank you. She was saying that, and I'm sitting, I was all the way in the back of the room, and I'm like, no, well, these are subjective. <laughs> Bless you again. Right. And, and of course, the problem with any Supreme Court argument is because it's time, right. um, you get out half an answer, yes. and somebody else is jumping on you over here, yes. and then you get the briars in the world to give you a three paragraph question. Oh my God. And I know. My, my, my partner, who met the other he said, I 
had no idea what question he asked you because he was so utterly obtuse. Was it you? I couldn't see. I was literally all the way in the back by the end at one point. Right. Um, who was at the podium? Was he right? Okay, I couldn't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was literally sure. all the way in the um, I like how you were like, you asked, you replied with a question to them. And I was like, yes, answer that. Justice Kagan, I think, was drilling you on the rest of 2A. Yeah. And I'm just like, but you're deviating for, from the issue at bar here. And then you said, well, that's not a question here. Well, they, they don't care much about that. Right. But I wanted to make that point because, you know, if, if it's not brief, you're, you're, you're really putting counsel in a difficult position. Right. Because, um, right. you know, how are we supposed to answer, especially when, frankly, yeah. it's a fine yeah. point. It's all, it's all in brief, uh, which is why we have to be very close to the UCLA because those guys are just awesome. Uh, they're phenomenal. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, look, it is what it is. It happens. It's over. The court hates both sides. I know. It, it really does. And I was, um, I've been following this case since, I mean, I read it in my trademark textbook, and then a month later, it was here at the Fed Circuit. Really? And so then I was up this morning at 5 a.m. and so I was just talking to somebody like, I feel like a lot of the community at WCL, I don't know that it, they necessarily you know, agree with this point of view, um, but for me, I, I mean, I do. Like, I think it, it makes sense. See, and the, it's, the, it's hard. I don't know. The, this, I, I've said this to so many people, when you pull back from the whole law and you look at the policy issues involved here, they are so incredibly divisive. In fact, they're so divisive that they are dividing the living community. Um, I mean, basically, most of the people up there, you know, they know you as a libertarian, but everybody else is sort of, you know, definitely on the liberal side of the right, scale. Right. We couldn't agree on issues. The petitioner does we don't agree at all on this stuff. And uh, uh, she took some shots at us. And, you know, you know, mm -hmm. you know that's that's mm -hmm. it's it's on the one hand I appreciate it, on the other hand. It, it's, it's an indication of just how divisive yeah. this whole topic is. I think the whole problem is cultural. Like, it's political practice. And I don't know how old you are, but I've got, I've got kids from like 22, 30. Yeah. And especially the younger ones. themselves good, bad, or indifferent. So let me oh, you're not, oh, your point is you may not be. Okay. Well, hang, 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 hang out. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah, one, okay. 
Yeah, okay. sure. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna grab my stuff. I have to go to my moot court argument oh, okay. uh, or okay. practice. May I have your card, please? Sure. If you have. Where are you guys flying in from? Uh, well, no, we took. Well, <laughs> we're just up in uh, outside of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. We're, we're in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, all over New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know I can't really talk about, you know, publicly about this, especially this business. I mean, I tried to make I mean, some was, comments, but. I had to write it down because I was boiling inside. I was just, every time he opened his book, I was just uh, Shapiro. Uh, oh, Ilya? I, I just couldn't because a lot of the things he said to me didn't, I can't see how he reconciles the idea of trademark as a way to silence. Because that, I think with that argument, you just get rid of trademark. Yeah, the problem with that argument is it plays into the hands of the people who want to control speech, um, and who want to control disparaging speech. Um, the, the, the response to that truly is simply this. In a in the limited commercial setting, trademark registration. Um, the Congress has determined that in, in, in order to uh, in order to uh, facilitate the, the largest variety of speakers through trademarks that are going to be protectable, um, then those who register will have priority and, and, and it extends to, the, to those who would seek to claim or challenge their exclusive right to use that mark. That's it. You can still take that mark, politicize it, satirize it, talk about it, debate it, write about it, do anything you want about it. register for other types. Of, I mean, there's Delta faucet, Delta yeah. air, Delta whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, so so th there's no suppression. And that that, but but, yeah. the, but again, one, you know, one, one of the problems is I mean, there's so many twists and turns in this area of law, yeah. And uh, that it's easy to just you know get lost in the weeds. Yeah, really absolutely. Like. Well, listen. Good luck in your move. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for coming to our school.